Yeah, and I'm really uh, happy that so many of you found uh, your way. It's a holiday today, I understand also in Norway. But I must say, I was very uh, intrigued by the topic of uh, this, uh, um, um, your design of Indism uh, this year, about boundaries. Because boundaries and challenging boundaries, this is Nerda. This is kind of um, a representation of our, how we work, what we try to achieve within our industry, because it's a difficult field. And I like uh, what Georg said just that about the critical optimism. Maybe that's a good um, platform of our discussion today, and I'm happy that I hopefully give you a kind of optimism, because as an architect, you are a problem solver, but you also have to be an optimist. And, and I think also to understand the, the important role of architecture within the built environment and what we are actually also um, um, ambassadors and we can, um, if we see architecture as a, social, as a tool for social change, I think you under, really understand what impact uh, our discipline can make. And um, in the background, you see the mountain Snerta. And uh, it's Snerta's history started about, well, 35 years ago. And it started actually with blurring boundaries between disciplines. It started as a workshop, as an interdisciplinary workshop between landscape architects and architects. And then over the years, we have expanded into the disciplines, uh, interior architecture and all the design disciplines and art with the true belief that you have to work and think is interdisciplinary in order to tackle um, all the, the complexity of the built environment. It's not, you can't work in a vacuum as an architect. So that is kind of the starting point of our, um, of our work. Yeah, as I said, it's about the, uh, the blurring boundaries and uh, we are designing for people. So it's really, having a clear uh, understanding of the, of the context um, and the interaction between uh, people. So that's why we every year, that is, this is my, uh, all my colleagues, um, because we have over the years, we have about 400, um, well, colleagues in, in offices I will show you later, but we are, from the very beginning, we worked across boundaries. So we, from the very beginning, even though we started in Norway, we work internationally. Uh, and also, our, all my colleagues, we have 14 nationalities, we speak a lot of languages, but what we do every year, and this is about experiencing the physical environment. We are, phys we are working with built an environment, so it's really about an understanding the environment. And uh, we are borrowing our name uh, from a mountain, Snerta. It's the second highest mountain in Norway. 250, about 250 meters high, and we say Snerta is the place that nobody is from, but everyone can go to, meaning it's really about the collective authorship, but also a mountain is at the same time an object, but it's also a landscape, so it's a really well representation of where we come from. So this is some images from the, the last walk, so we meet together, we really kind of um, remind ourselves from our origins and it's also a little bit about how it is an architecture. You start with the uh, blank paper but then it's kind of finding your way. It's about the art of prepositions, relate your body to the environment. It's about, um, yeah, it's over, under, uh, it's behind, you look into the sky and then you, sun, and then you finally reach the goal. But having a landscape uh, as a reference, as a point of departure, it's really a strong statement. And for us in Norway, landscape has this kind of very uh, strong presence. So it's also kind of, and, and it re represents also our environment that is very vulnerable, as you know. And our um, industry has a significant contribution to that state uh, at the moment, of course. But yeah, but this is uh, our, um, all my colleagues here in, uh, in front of our Oslo office. And um, we have over the years uh, expanded into um, studios all over the world. It started in Oslo, then we opened a studio in New York, and as you can see, then we have studios in Paris, Innsbruck, Adelaide, Hong Kong, um, uh, Melbourne, and the latest office we opened two weeks ago in Shenzhen. But it's not about kind of the expansion and crossing borders and boundaries per se. It's always projects first and it's an organic growth. 
we always had the project and then we acquired new projects, so it's a natural kind of development. And the biggest office is still in Oslo, there we are about, um, well, now 120 uh, people. And if you have a closer look at our portfolio, I don't know if you have recognized this, but they're not style, it's not a style-driven uh, approach. It's really about the reading and uh, understanding of boundaries, uh, of course, but also about the, the contextual understanding, re reading the different frameworks um, politically, socially, of course, contextually, the physical environment, climate, society, politics, and then really to try to find an adequate um, translation into a built uh, environment. And I think it's a really value-driven approach, and you will see this later, because it's about obviously about people, the processes that lead to the design, and then uh, hopefully the built um, responses give you an idea how how we kind of um, try to translate this value-driven approach. But it's really born out of the Nordic values that are based on openness, democracy, and accessibility. And if you have that in mind, to really try to be an advocate for this value, that also impacts the way how you design and develop architecture. That really has to lead to a better society in the end. This is a very simple uh, statement, but still it gives you also a responsibility and, and uh, yeah, to really see that this is something that is, is um, relevant for, for people, not only limited to the specific building uh, site. And Snerta's inception, 1987, I would say I'm the second uh, generation of Snerta, is based on the uh, UN development uh, report, uh, Our Common Future of the United Nations. That's actually the first time where we spoke about uh, sustainability or sustainable development. It was our Prime Minister, Gu Harlem Bundland, that was leading that report. But it says that um, sustainable development means that you, of course, a generation has to develop, but not compromise the potential of the future generations. And if you keep that in mind, that also says something about how the impact uh, of what you do you ha really have to think about the future and, and what the impact of your actions, what they might entail. So dissolving boundaries, that's a little bit the first chapter of my uh, talk today, designing for people, but really to understand how important it is that you have the right processes and design methodologies to, uh, to capture and to respect all the uh, complex um, um, parts of, of the design. Yeah, this is our Oslo studio. We are sitting in an old warehouse close to the harbor. And I think we, are, we start with ourselves. We say SNRD is our most important project. And that has to do because within how we treat ourselves, how we um, speak with our colleagues, the respectness, the generosity, how we work together, it's also reflected in our built environment because we are convinced that the built environment also impacts how you behave and, and uh, how you treat um, well, other people. So this is a very open uh, demo, um, um, space and we have in all our studios around the world, we have this kind of lunch situation. We have chefs who are preparing lunch. It's about social interactions. Get to know your colleagues. We sometimes say it's not allowed to speak about architecture. And we have this kind of route map, how we organize our spaces. It's, it's a very maybe uncommon way of, of, uh, of, of collaboration. We are not clustering uh, our projects, so not the teammates who are working on one project are not sitting together. They really spread out all uh, over the studio space because on your way to your team member, you will get a lot of uh, information on your way that might be relevant for your specific project. By that, we achieve quite a good informal level of competence and knowledge sharing without having to systemize it too much. So I think this is a very good way of, of kind of achieving also a kind of this collective approach, uh, obviously, but also then uh, giving uh, everyone uh, the same square meters, independent from the position you have in the company. If you're an intern or a founder or you're in the leader group, doesn't matter. You have the same number of uh, space and every yeah, we are. Oh, so now it was a bit, a little quick. Oh, sorry, was it wrong? No, suddenly I want to get back. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I wanted actually just to say that we are swapping seats every second year. And if you had a dark spot, you get a lighter spot at the, the sitting then at the window. Okay. We are also by kind of, maybe it's also part of a post-rationalization of our design methodology. We also have invented our own vocabulary, so to say. We have one term that we call transpositioning. And that's kind of really about, um, well, dissolving boundaries between professions, but also between architects and clients. We have invented a kind of workshop methodology where we then invite a big spectrum of um, team members, obviously, but also could also sometimes be critics of the project. And we really encourage in these uh, processes to swap professions, to pr swap roles, really then to, to enhance this thinking out of the box. Meaning if the client becomes an architect, the landscape architect becomes a sociologist just for a day, we really then try to, to get everything um, not only limited to your professional role you have, but really as a human. So by trying this, it sounds very playful, but it's actually a very uh, useful methodology to get a little bit of deeper understanding and again to think, think out of the box. And the team work is obviously an important tool. And not only internally, but also we work in a network um, of well, within the industry, we had a lot of industry partners, but it's really understanding, not limiting your your, um, your professional radius into the into your office, but also having a lot of uh, research partners. Uh, with, we col collaborate with universities. We have PhD programs. We have a lot of industry partners. So it's really becoming a roadmap rather than a single singular architectural practice working from inside out. So I think, I think this is really a shift also in the understanding of within our industry and practice. So it's more rather a roadmap, a really a network with blurred boundaries rather than having a very clear, distinct footprint. And SNERTA, we have also been part of a research project that was conducted in Norway over four years. And um, this uh, research picked out four different companies within the Norwegian um, field that are dealing with innovation. And Snerta was an architecture office, obviously, but then we had lawyers and we have uh, oil finding companies and a, d uh, a company that work with data, all, with, all on the top innovation field within their discipline. And the, to uh, the goal of this research was, are there some generic drivers that lead to innovation, independent from the professional field that you are in? So this publication, uh, it's also, I think you still can, can get it. They, uh, the main founding is kind of structured in, in 12 different um, drivers, they call it, that lead to innovation. And, uh, being an object of a research, we used this founding to develop a workshop method that we called um, uh, that we called um, well a Snerta concept workshop. And now, I just wanted to show you this is a very structured workshop where we again invite our clients and collaborators one day into an office, and by by kind of trying to enhance the discussion about architecture, the project, without starting to design. That's very important. It's really about getting a contextual understanding of what is the essence, the goal with this project. So we start with the prepping. We have, uh, it's, it's about uh, working in different work groups. It it's works on an associative level. So it's really about what does represent the project, and what does not the, represent the project. But by starting in a very playful manner, you already increase the level of consciousness. You kind of, you start on, on the wider circle and then you get closer and closer to the core. So then you, um, then you will present these findings to, findings to you, the other team members, and then it's about zooming out. It's boiling everything, trying to find, is there one term that represents the project? Is there one term that we think we want to work, continue working with? And then you take this, and then you're getting, finally getting physical. You're using then our workshops in the office to build a physical representation of that finding, of that essence like a conceptual springboard. And this is a very, very useful exercise because, of course, you get to know each other um, and also by using the transpositioning 
as an informal tool to also then uh, leave a little bit the boundaries of your profession. But then uh, secondly, and the most important part, you with this co-creational process, you lay the ground for the further development. And we see also in very complex projects, when a client, for example, has the possibility to contribute to the birth of the project, he uh, they will also be interested to, to support the further development. That will, of course, um, have a lot of iterations and would take many years. But you contribute and you take responsibility. That's maybe the little bit the, the main uh, framework for this exercise. And it's, it's very, very helpful. And um, um, this, our work and method is kind of summarized in our latest publication, which is kind of, which is called Collective Intuition. And it um, organizes our project very loosely around three change, chains, as you can see here. Um, one is, of course, very most importantly, the integration of disciplines. Then it's uh, the generosity of collective ownership that I tried to explain you a little bit about uh, how we uh, organize our processes. And then, of course, architecture is always about politics. Architecture is a political space. That's why we have, <laughs> we have really to take our responsibility very seriously. Because when you look back in history, you also see how architecture has been misused. So taking the role of being an, an ambassador of democratic, open, accessible spaces also in the very end impacts how we live together and uh, it's also our societies. That's at least our true belief and what we really try to stress in all our projects. Also sometimes when we have, um, well, we have to um, convince also a lot uh, work for it. It's nothing that happens uh, on its own. So the experimentation uh, with boundaries, that is kind of what we always do. That's why I loved really much this uh, topic of uh, your Indesim uh, seminar this time. And it's about um, start with this project, making culture and knowledge more accessible. The opera was already mentioned. Um, for me, it's still one of our most important projects. It's a kind of a game changer in a way. How also we see the role of cultural buildings in society. Because it was an open competition, we were asked to design a cultural monument, but we thought, okay, we have to translate it into a social monument. When you invest so much money into a public venue that has limited accessibility due to the ticketing, to, to see a performance, you have to buy a ticket. We really wanted to also decrease the, the, um, the boundaries, so to say, within the public realm, but um, so it really becomes a social destination. And Norway is also very young culture when it comes to cultural, um, well, tradition. We are borrowing most of our re uh, references from Central Europe. So it's also finding a typology, a completely new typology that represents kind of the well, to limit the threshold between um, um, the, the, yeah, the, the, the public realm and what is happening inside the building. So really in translating this more as an accessible landscape, a non-commercial space, that's also a very important. And putting the most valuable material on top of the building that is owned by everyone. So in the Scandinavian countries, we have a very interesting uh, heritage right. It's called the right to roam. And this is also something that works against boundaries, so to say, because it says landscape belongs to everyone. You can put your tent wherever you want in the landscape for a couple of days. You have to respect a certain distance to private property, but basically it belongs to all. So this thinking, which is from the 1950s, it's a very, very intuitive, well-embedded right that we have in uh, the Nordic countries. This is something we try to translate into the built environment for the opera. So you don't have to think so much. You will intuitively use this as a landscape because you, it's so embedded within the cultural heritage within our societies. So really trying to, to find a language that supports, that, that allows for the interaction between the individual, but also then negotiating with the opera to increase the public realm into the building because we are living in a harsh climate. So it's also about the indoor public space. Again, to 
limit or to open the boundaries between inside and outside to experience that this is something as an extensive interior landscape. And it's also reflected in the language of the architecture that is more abstract. So we said you shouldn't find anything here that you would like to see at home. So also then working with a very simple material palette, um, this wooden um, wall that represents the transition between the public um, and the public realm and the um, theater venues. So here you see by uh, refining the wood, and the material surface leads you into the, well, this is the main attraction, of, obviously, of the opera, the, um, the theater hall. A lot of integration of art by the American artist Pei. Looks like crushed aluminium, but it's actually a woven fa fabric. The roof is also an art project, um, and that also allowed us to kind of, I wouldn't say disrespect uh, building codes, but by having the uh, roof declared as a piece of art, because there were three artists working on it, we, we were allowed to do things that normally we wouldn't. So it also required a brave client. Um, so allow this kind of making this inviting public landscape, and of course, um, it's my favorite image because the opera performs at its best when you have an open air concert on top of the roof and at the same time you have an opera performance. So it's inside the building. So it's about using the ground twice, which also actually is a political dimension because it's really respecting the value of um, our, our ground, so to say. So by increasing functionality, like here, it gives you a double value. Yeah, and again, about blurring uh, boundaries between landscape performance. This is our um, design for uh, Pergin Festival in Gorlo, uh, an hour north of Norway. Here we used actually the lake as the scenography for this uh, theater play. So really seeing the, the surroundings as a natural extension, a curated extension of the scenography. Um, I think it's also a good example. Or, for example, the underwater uh, restaurant under, a natural experimentation with uh, boundaries for Snurta, building in, in water and on land at the same time. Um, you can see it's in the south of uh, Norway, Christian Sun, where you have brackish water and saltish water coming together. So you have a really, really rich underwater life um, species growing there which led also to the collaboration with the Maritime Institute of the university there. So it's for them also a kind of research center for underwater life. So it's again this kind of uh, broadly thinking, uh, blurring boundaries between the functionality. So an underwater restaurant can also then suddenly act as a maritime institute, um, as you can see here. So really working also with the scenography, um, it's a 35, 38 meter long building, um, working with the scenography, the, well, reflecting the, what you can see, the, the uh, water palette, uh, the color palette underwater. And this is also a project where we worked with all our disciplines. So our design and brand department also did the, um, the uh, visual identity under has actually a double meaning in Norwegian, it means under, underwater, and it means also wonder, under, wonder. So it's a wonder underwater, so it's kind of playing a little bit with this. Um, um, so let's see, oh, I just, oh, he yeah, actually had a small film. Mm -mm -mm -mm. It should actually uh, walk. No? No, so, sorry. Here I actually had a film. It should normally it starts automatically. I don't know what happened here, but uh, just to show you how um, well the different platform that we work with, with the with the web page and the um, visual identity all coming together in one holistic expression. That is also the most fun project. And also we work with um, industry partners to work with the acoustic tactiles. So in this project we were able to design all the components from furniture, working also with the in, uh, construction industry in this region that are very used to working, uh, constructing in the water. With, as you can see here, they're coming from the oil industry, obviously, but they have a specific com competence working in water. 
And I think here I also have a film, but I'm not sure if this is working because when I click here, ah, now it works, okay. Uh, another um, very new recent installation that we did in Trevik Osen in, in Norway. In Norway, we have a program, it's called the Senec Root Program. It's actually by the uh, state um, root, uh, how can you say, um, society that we have these different viewing points along very beautiful scenic routes uh, across Norway. And here we had this installation really to, again, having this physical experience walking into the water, really also then crossing boundaries, so to say, and experiencing kind of the tide and the different water levels. So really enhancing uh, and, and increasing the relationship uh, towards nature. Another project that we did that you might be familiar with is the Reindeer Observation Pavilion, now again at the Mountain Snurta, which um, we got the very interesting task that you might only get once in a lifetime to design a viewing pavilion just to observe nature. <coughs> so it's one of our um, smallest public buildings, uh, really, and, and it's just to give you a protected environment uh, to, to observe the beauty of this uh, nature because we have a lot of interesting animals there. There's also moscus uh, beside reindeers. It's the only region in Norway where we have moscus. And when we are thinking in those typologies, we always look into contextual typologies, like you're borrowing the proportion from a, a, a local farm and then thinking, okay, it's, we have to establish a boundary. Again, we have to establish a frame just to understand this is the, uh, to, to kind of frame the place of observation and then it's kind of develop an interior that is contrasting, that is more related uh, to the, the human body, so to say. So, uh, and these kind of two counterparts are, uh, is the simple concept of the, of the project. And then we are building a lot of prototypes in our office. We are lucky to have the 3D mill where we can really build big mock-ups. We're also selecting the material for this project, really hand-picked. So it's a highly curated project, so we really were able to uh, control all the quality um, segments, so to say. The boat building factory, it's transported on their truck and then put together very simply just by using old ancient technology, um, craftsmen without any, uh, it's only wooden construction. Yeah, and you can go there, you can stay there with your family and friends, no one will throw you out. And it's, it's a beautiful setting for this uh, fantastic landscape that we have here. And here really by night, it turns into a more organic uh, sculpture. And inter interestingly, the same reindeers in this region, you also find them in this region in France, in the Dordogne and Montignac, where we got the commission to design the well, it's called a visitor center, but it's actually a cave museum. It's um, one hour's drive uh, from Bordeaux. In this region, it's really the sinister chapel of um, Paleolithic um, findings. So there are a lot of uh, caves here for this, uh, from this century, for this age. And uh, our museum, uh, you can see it here, it's located in the transition between the dense forest and the more cultivated uh, landscape. So we thought, okay, when we are working with a project of that kind, we really want to find a typology that is kind of a non-architecture, that really blends uh, into the landscape and because a cave, which is the main attraction, of, is also something that is in the landscape. It's not necessarily visible. So part of the project was the artificial representation, uh, a re rebuilding actually of the cave, because the original cave that was discovered in the 1980s, it was destroyed, it was open for a few years, but then uh, due to the, um, the occupancy, it's, it's too vulnerable. So in order to make this period of um, history, history accessible, the decision was to build a replica of that cave. Um, so as you can see here, that also requires from our side a really high digital competence. So the original cave was, um, was uh, scanned with a millimeter scan. So also by that w there were made findings of old paintings that wasn't dis weren't discovered anymore. 
So you see here, this is the construction. It's really also to find the construction form that is, makes this experience possible. This is from the backside. And also, actually, it's also a kind of a contemporary art project. I think 30 artists were involved to uh, repaint, uh, so to say, the original paintings, but then again also to implement the new findings. Um, so it's it's quite a took quite a, quite a while, but you can see here how it blends nicely into the landscape, and it's more a journey about understanding the past by also relating yourself to the present. So it's about past, present, future. Uh, which is uh, for a lot of our projects. So this is the, the experience that you have in the uh, uh, um, artificial cave. You have the same humidity. So you can, of course, criticize that it's an artificial experience. But on the other hand, um, if you remember how I started my lecture today, it's also about that the, to experience physically your environment. It's not, it's not enough just to read about it. You really get at least a sense of how it could have been. And then how we sequence the, um, the, the journey through the building is that you always also relate it back to the presence, like here, the so-called cave gardens. You step out from the dark environment, you see, you relate yourself to the smell, the noise, the temperature outside. And then you have the more contemporary galleries that also have the, uh, the state-of-the-art uh, exhibition design where you then relate uh, yourself back to the future also. So this is kind of another example also for me how landscape architecture works uh, together. And of course it's easy to speak about and also when we say we are crossing boundaries, when you work in contexts that are very similar to your own, it's much more difficult when you enter society's political system that you don't agree with, but still um, where I think it's possible to make a difference. So Snerta, we were commissioned with the first cultural, public cultural center in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Dachan. And you have to imagine that in these societies there are no public venues like theater, museum, opera, children's museum, everything we take for granted. that They were non-existent. So for us it was also how can we find a topology that represent this kind of the new. Um, and, and we, we um, thought about having this, all the different functions like the Roman arch. Uh, that they ha they are kind of in an interdependency to the other to this other and here we have the keystone that was the children's museum then that uh, keeps uh, everything together and from this this is from the competition illustration we developed this um, typology like stones in the desert and every stone inhabits a different uh, function the library the first library uh, in, in Saudi Arabia and this is the built result. So it's a kind of also a one of a kind project, and of course you can criticize again to work in these societies. But I must say, um, and here yeah, I'll just give you a small narrative about when you have a strong concept, how you then develop the sub concepts again. Here you have the the stone and the um, and then you have kind of the translated and get more and more concrete. We tested it in front of our own office in Oslo, because a lot of these functions have don't require daylight, and we also use this pipe for for cooling the building. And this is from the construction side, and of course most of uh, my colleagues working and including myself on this project were women. And they asked us at the end, what's wrong with a Norwegian man? Because, <laughs> of course, in these uh, societies, they're, they're not used to having uh, kind of that kind of female presence. But the clients also uh, moved with their main representatives to Oslo and sat with us for a series of two years, working with us. Um, and really, we're having this kind of, well, sometimes confrontation of culture, but then also kind of listening and using the tool of demo, uh, democracy um, in, in, in the kind of development. This is just to give you an overview. Uh, and the, the building is entered by a big uh, plaza and then you have the different pebbles, the function that are, um, this is the main entrance. 
and also combining using um, materials rammed earth from that is really uh, from that region. And we have this uh, public plaza and the different entrances into the different cultural function. This is the library. Um, again, the first public library uh, in, in the region. These oasis uh, gardens um, with different breakouts, the uh, performance space, the theater, um, yeah, and the big landscape on top. And one good example is actually a project that we had after the, the building was opened in 2018, I think it was. We had a, a, um, a commission for an exhibition uh, these five pavilions for the Norwegian painter Edvard Munch. And Edvard Munch was, is in, in this context, quite a controversial choice because for the first time also, I mean, there were also um, paintings with naked people shown uh, on. This would not have been possible without the building. So it's really about step by step, of course, um, really uh, acquiring social uh, social change. And I think what for me is also um, important by this example, um, for example, we managed that men, men and women can go through the same entrance. That would not be possible for my women could drive cars in this uh, area. So a lot of small steps, but also how the building is operated today. They have very young um, curators for the program, inviting people from abroad. So I think it's it's an interesting project. Again, you can be criticized, but when we see what the impact it has created for social change, um, I think it's it's um, I'm quite impressed. So now um, I'm coming to the third chapter, so to say, of my talk, which may be the most important one, because challenging boundaries when facing the climate change. This is a, may, maybe the most important task for the architects today. And you can't do it on your own. You really are dependent on collaboration with uh, competences from outside your own um, core discipline. And you have to experiment and uh, most importantly challenge established building rules. So um, I hope you have understood a little bit today that this is what we have done every time. The, the core of everything we do is the social responsibility. But we have also set uh, ourselves a goal, this was about 15 years ago, that all our projects in design should be CO2 ne negative. And of course then every build result should be the same. And these are maybe numbers that you, have, that you are very familiar with, but it shows really uh, the role of our um, industry when it comes to, to climate change. And, and this, these are numbers that we have to deal with. I mean, otherwise, um, again, the, the counter-action of optimism would maybe say the best square meter is the square meter not built. But there is a, there's still a need for um, new construction, but of course also the retrofit of already existing structures. So in 2010, as kind of the starting point, uh, of systemizing this approach, it's not that we are founding a powerhouse alliance. It's a registered trademark, and we are the architects, and we are collaborating with, uh, you see, research institutions, of course, but also with the constructor. Uh, we have a client, we have engineering disciplines, so we have an alliance, uh, uh, an agreement. Uh, there's also a separate web page, you can find the project that we are working on, but most importantly we are committing to, as far as I know, still the highest ambition when it comes to sustainable uh, developments of buildings worldwide. Because what you see, we have a clear definition, this counts for a period of over 60 years, what what, what these buildings should do, that they should of course produce more energy than they consume, but most importantly, that we also have to um, compensate for all the embodied energy in the building materials. But because this is the most important part. You can optimize the building in operations, you can well, use as less materials as possible, but materials, materials, materials. It's actually about materials when we come, when we can, where we really can, can make a change. So the definition of the powerhouse as well, the operational energy demand is, should be, of course, low, 
plus the embodied energy and the production of renewable energy on site. So you can't just connect yourself to a solar park that is 100 kilometers away. You have to deal with the problem on site. So I think these kind of factors, um, and we have also within the Powers Alliance uh, develop a guide for the Norwegian uh, building industry, how to tackle the problem to reach the Paris Agreement. Maybe the 1.5 degree is, a, is quite ambitious. If we are lucky, we maybe reach two <laughs> degrees. But still, we have developed with, within these competences um, um, something where we can at least systemize uh, our activities, which I think is important. It's not a question of lack of competence, it's really using the competence in a collaborative and new way. You don't have to invent everything uh, new. And these are the buildings that we have realized within the Powerhouse Alliance so far, three office buildings, one a small Montessori school in Norway, and this has a budget of three million euros, so it's not really a question of building construction uh, um, budget. So these are the, the main drivers. I would just quickly run you through the example. This is a retrofit. It was the first um, plus energy uh, refurbished building in the world uh, that also um, encounters uh, compensates for the embodied energy. Two of these blocks, 6,000 6, square meters. This is a, it's a, it's a very generic example here. We also there was a monument protection aspect because this building was said to be a very typical representative of this time. That's why we couldn't change the facade expression. So we had to respect it, but we, as you can see, we changed it into a wooden construction using the Japanese uh, sugi method where you burn the outer shell um, and then you have a, a clear wood, uh, weather protection of the, of the um, uh, timber. Yeah, so the, the, the entire building was uh, emptied, and this is how we visualized it and, and after. So it's very, again very close to, because you have to sit around the table when you develop these buildings, because every single decision you made, you have to calculate if it works with your energy concept and the, the goal you want to achieve. So it's really a very close collaboration between all the partners and also you have to challenge, again, you mentioned construction uh, and building codes. Here we could use uh, an um, escape stair, fire escape stair as a, a ventilation duct, a big ventilation duct, which will normally not be possible if you would develop a building according to what is applic ac the applicable code. So that required also that you go into the dialogue with the municipalities, uh, that you get your um, co-workers and uh, well engineers to write reports, that they take responsibility, that they take risk. Very important. Otherwise, no innovation without risk. So that is kind of, you have to have uh, together kind of commit to these developments, otherwise it's not possible. So yeah, just a, a quick set of what is required. We produce energy, we use um, display ventilation uh, where we use shafts, we have kind of multiple, multiple use of building components for ventilation and transport, vertical transports. Uh, so we, a lot of drivers that uh, together lead to the result. Another building, a new one that we have built in, in Trondheim in Norway that has, in terms of climate, quite challenging conditions. Um, so we, so you, one could say it's really hard to get the result, but again, the same kind of catalog uh, that is required for new building, same as for a retrofit building, but then also to understand the context using all the digital tools, tools you have in order to efficiently also then uh, adapt the design according to the environment, so the energy effective using solar power that also then informs the orientation of your building, you, uh, measuring wind, is this something that can support kind of a natural ventilation strategy, then kind of to work with the geometry of the build roof, whether to optimize this for solar harvesting, yeah, some um, some visuals, and then also then to use the facade. So all the this informed uh, design process that is necessary in order to to reach the uh, ambition.
Yeah, this is uh, unfortunately in Norwegian, but just to show you, this is what we achieved, and this is actually what is uh, the building standard in Norway at that time. Um, so you see, it's 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 quite quite an achievement. What is also challenging with this building is always the conflict. Uh, and using the thermal mass of the concrete slabs uh, and then the acoustical requirements. So you have to expose 50% of the um, slabs uh, so to make this uh, work. Yeah, just to some images that you can see how it's in, in the build result. And this is still the world's northernmost um, plus energy building in the world. So we said uh, these are pilots. But at the same time, they also inspire, hopefully, um, to well mimic. We have an open source on all these projects. So we really want to encourage to just um, well go the same path. It's it's not something that we keep this as a um, as a secret, so to say. Another project that we are developing within the same uh, powerhouse constellation is a hotel at the glacier uh, Swart Isen. So we see it's above the Arctic Circle. It has the well a beautiful natural view, and it, uh, the goal is that it um, uh, only uses 15% of the um, standard energy juice. So this is the site. There's nothing there, no infrastructure, nothing. So of course you can also say, do we really have to build in those environments? And I think. It's better that you control the occupancy rather than uh, letting, well, unlimited number of people going there. I will explain you also that the, the chain of transport is also part of the concept. So again, we looked at what is the traditional um, building, um, uh, well, ways of building in that area. There's a lot of um, wooden houses for fishermen, for dry fish. So we wanted to develop a typology that is kind of something that doesn't leave a firm permanent footprint, so you can also dismount it very easily. And it's like an animal kind of that lives both on land and on water. And what is super interesting with working within this typology that you really have to understand the user journeys uh, and to really um, let those inform then your energy uh, concept, because a lot of times of the day, during the day, people are getting out and experiencing nature and they will only mainly use the building during night and, and mornings and evenings. So, um, and again, the same tools that are required to understand the capability of the building um, and also, uh, well, how to, uh, how can we uh, the foundations of the building that have a big impact on the energy and the embodied energy of a building uh, to, to make conscious choices there. Um, this is not built yet, eh? so these are visuals. But um, I enclosed this, a little bit boring um, diagram, but I think it's really important to understand um, this is a life cycle calculation. But what we also did is to include replacement of building components. For example, a window, when you calculate in 60 years, a window you have to exchange once. Uh, so you have to double uh, the amount of windows, for example. While foundations will normally last much longer, uh, they are, will last for maybe 200 years or something. And again, um, why, what is also important when you, when you work within that kind of, um, well, calculation of embodied energy, the horizontal building components, uh, they have a much larger footprint um, uh, than the vertical. So columns are actually of minor importance. It's more what you choose for the decks uh, that really uh, have the largest impact. And what you also can see when you work with solar um, PV installations, they have a high um, level of embodied energy, but they will pay back since they are kind of producing energy over a period of five to six years, depending on the capacity. Yeah, so just to, say, uh, to show you, um, this is kind of maybe it looks a little boring, but it's really important when you, when you dive into these kind of um, ways of working and taking um, um, sustainability seriously, you have to, to implement other design. You have to increase complexity when you design. You have to collaborate, you have to measure 
your decisions. So it's not about ugly and beautiful anymore. It's, re it's really about measuring the impact. And that gives a different design. That's why we say formless environment. And, and it will lead to different aesthetics also that is kind of in, inconvenient maybe from the beginning because there are other drivers uh, that, that uh, lead the design. And uh, speaking of the importance of material research, uh, Snerta, we have a lot of ongoing material research. Uh, one of, uh, a very prominent one, an important one is, um, you see, plast. It's a Norwegian word for plastic. So we have, uh, for a lot of uh, many years, tried to investigate the importance of recyclable plastic because plastic is a very popular, um, and, and this was a, a container that we've docked into. This is our office. So we are using this for schools and for, for just to education, just to, um, well, increase uh, the, um, increase the um, uh, knowledge, uh, obviously. And uh, plastic has, since the 1960s, been, has an, an extreme increase in use because it has a lot of wonderful, um, wonderful characteristics. It's durable, it's cheap to produce, it has a lot of colors, it's lightweight, it's long-lasting. So, but a lot of, and it's, 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 a, it's a polymer that is based on oil, obviously, but um, we have focused in our research to, well, to really be an advocate for um, to the use of recycled uh, plastics, and we have tried to. Well, this is uh, all images from our internal research where we picked up plastic. We tried to investigate the uh, granulates and so on, and we we also wanted to implement our findings. So we had worked with two partners from different industries. One is the NPC; it's a furniture production. A company, and then it's the fish uh, fish industry from the north of Norway, because the Norwegian fishing industry, which is actually our second largest industry in Norway, there's a lot of waste from these fish nets. They're just thrown away after a series of uses. So we managed kind of to connect these uh, us with the two uh, um, um, industries and we produced a makeover of uh, Norwegian design classics, this S20 uh, chair, and also the, the steel is a recyclable component. So really, um, and we have another um, research with the startup um, in Norway on concrete using geopolymer and, and still of uh, what is normally used in, in Portland cement in, in concrete, because concrete is the most used um, building material in the world, and it stands for 8% of the world's global emissions. So it's really crucial to find new ways, and I, I know there's a lot of research going on, but with this receipt, we think that will be reduced the CO2 with 70%. And we we aim for 100 percent. And and mycelium is maybe also a very familiar product for you. But we work with a lot of startups in Norway. This is another one where we we wanted also to work with materials that are 100 percent compostable, like mycelium is. So we developed these kind of sound um, for interior use. They are fire resistant and have a wonderful sound protection capacity. So we uh, work with another startup for those. And uh, we have also an increased um, problem with e-waste. So we work together with an um, um, Italian company to produce uh, tiles from the waste from microwaves even. So we have a lot of ongoing research that is um, for really driving material change. And the last part uh, where I want to expand a little bit on the single building um, sphere into a larger neighborhood, thinking in systems, because I think that's also important that we try to um, establish synergies when we develop uh, cities and new neighborhoods. So we have one project under development in Norway. This will be Norway's first natural climatized building. Um, so it should not, as we call it, triple waste, uh, tri triple zero concept. So no energy is used for cooling, heating and ventilation. Um, and this is uh, the first of its kind in Norway. 
And why natural climatization? I think it's also important when, it, when we think about uh, um, embodied energy, but it gives you a healthier climate and you also save a lot of technical insulation. Why I always include this one? Because I think also within your uh, theme for your seminar, it's the way of we work together is makes a significant difference in, in, in order to what we are able to achieve. So we organize our design processes also with all the external disciplines in completely different ways now. We work a lot of work workshop based because when we work within these fields, it's really about, it's like research basically. We start with a goal uh, and we end up with a synthesis, but we lead a lot of iterations together in order to see if our assumptions uh, are doable, basically. Um, so I think this is uh, it's a good representation of how we work in order to achieve the goal. Yeah, this is the location of uh, the project. And it's, it's a very generic one. You will find those kind of industrial areas in transformation in any city. Here's the opera. So it's in the north of, um, on the way to our big uh, water reservoir in, in the north here. Um, yeah, so we'll find these. Uh, uh, but I think what is important when we work with natural climatization is to stand and measure again the context. Wind uh, directions are uh, obviously important, so we work a lot with models, but it's also about finding a, ge a geometry that supports that you really can utilize the wind power. So the cross ventilation recorders kind of um, requires a different type of geometry. Again, you would normally maybe not, the building would not look like that if you wouldn't have uh, um, wanted to use the ventilation strategies. It's a mixed use building, so we have office and residential areas, and also uh, work with uh, radiant surfaces, obviously, but the wind and the cross ventilation, this is the main principle. So it's a mixed use, we have offices, we have a, a quite a big residential component, the red one and some retail functions in order to also to activate uh, the building with the public realm. Again, an important, yeah, some, this is under construction now. Some images also, again, you see here we had some, um, again, to work with the acoustics and the utilization of the, um, the capacity of the uh, slabs for thermal exchange just to and, uh, give you some ideas. Uh, and it will be, yeah, it, it's a high-rise building. It's about uh, 20,000 square meters. An important project also for us when it comes to reconstruction, retrofit was the reconstruction, rebuild of the Times Square in New York that also led to the establishment of our um, uh, US studio. And this is a project, I mean, it, it, it was a contested space. I don't know if any of you have been there before, um, but this has, we started with this in the year 2000. So we worked with it, I think, 15 years. But it was mainly to, to, uh, to transform the vehicle space into a pedestrian space. Uh, you can see there are a lot of sequences, so it took a lot of years. Um, but I think what is important, it's, it's also a big infrastructure uh, project because all the um, the underground uh, had, has to be exchanged as well. Um, but it it was a space that was actually <laughs> abandoned by the New Yorkers. It's the most frequented uh, square in the world, 300,000 people a day. But the New Yorkers hated it. It was more or less a destination for tourism. But it's also a kind of a foyer for all the Broadway theaters around this, the, the Times Square. So we um, designed a lot of these benches. They also uh, contained technical infrastructure, internet, to allow for these in situ performances that happen there. And similar to the Opera House, it also acts like a, a open foyer performance uh, or a theater space for the live um, performance of the Met Opera that is broadcasted here um, for free. And then three minutes to midnight, uh, all the advertisement it turn, turned into an uh, art light show. Um, and what we always do, we try to measure our, well, the project with which uh, maybe have the heaviest footprint, also the public project. We have the post-occupancy studies 
also to learn if whether our assumption worked out or what we can improve. So we have kind of our small internal research department as well. And I want to close off with the development that we have at the moment in Milan, in Italy. Uh, it should, it's, the ambition is to turn, um, it's an old slaughterhouse area uh, on the way to Linate, the airport in the uh, east of Milan, 190,000 square meters of development area, new and uh, old construction. And the aim is to, to turn it into the first CO2 negative neighborhood of Milan. You can see this is an old slaughterhouse area, it's abandoned and has a quite rich history, very romantic images, which all the architects, of course, loved a lot. But, I mean, they are in bad shape, but we also, as part of our concept, try to uh, protect and reuse as many of these as possible, and by this we save 4,300 cubic meters of concrete, which is a lot uh, in this development. And just to give you an idea, it, it's, it's a complex organization. It started with the C40 competition, which is a global competition format where public, where it's, it's a collaboration of, of mayors all over the world. They give big um, public um, plots into the pot. And developers and architects, they compete together in a, in a uh, quite long selection process. Um, they design and they give a promise. And by that, the, the private um, um, developer can take over the property, the public property. But you have to realize the promise you gave with the design um, proposal. So this will be a big master plan. It will last for many, many years. We have just started, but it's... It's organized in, in several clusters and, and the landscape component is very important. The first we did, we of course protected all trees. We, take, we took away the fence uh, around the area, but here will be, for example, a design, the EIT Design University. There will be a lot of student housing, social housing, offices, hotel. There are some old buildings that will turn into have cultural functions, galleries. Museum, so we have a kind of a cultural park here where we have the listed buildings. So it's, it's a very interesting project, just to give you an idea. And those are, of course, complex processes. And it's, it's a very, very simple uh, diagram. But again, it, it shows you what, of course, the first is the material um, that we, that we, um, that we use, reuse as much as possible, but then it's also about the um, CO2 mitigation, the transport and the mobility, um, the energy um, production, and, and also how we think in system, not only singular plots anymore, and the CO2 storage that the landscape component plays an important part. Yeah, just, I mean, this is in planning process, but what what is our idea, the vision of how this could look like, the reuse of the existing building as community building. Yeah, the same thing that I spoke about earlier, that the, the most important part is, of course, the floor step. You see it again, and also transparent surfaces play an important role in the CO2 uh, emissions. And also the uh, development of new... Um, ventilation and heating systems that uh, we have systems that can both cool and heat up and they are kind of we are thinking in neighborhoods so offices and residential and uh, culture can can work with one system which obviously also saves a lot of energy so it's a fifth generation of uh, heat heat pumps uh, for example yeah some images and what is a nice um, well maybe still a think piece, but we are working also with the university in Italy who have developed these air factories that are by now in a very small format in one of the uh, former existing buildings, but they just demonstrate how plants can purify air, and this is something that we intend to scale up uh, on, on larger components in the project. So there are a lot of sub-small research projects within the big scale as well in this project. Some images, yeah. And most importantly, and this is my last project, it's our smallest project for the largest number of inhabitants, so to say. It's uh, some beehives 
that we built ourselves in the office and we mounted on an office building in Norway. But it's just also to, to remind ourselves the importance of bees in the food production and, and that we have to increase the possibility of habitats also within the urban fabric. Thank you very much.